In 1952, an engineer and amateur archivist, Leslie Linder, was given a collection of papers. It was a secret journal written code. It had been discovered amongst the belongings of a world-famous writer and painter. For six years, Linda struggled fruitlessly to find a key to the code so that the journal could be read. Then, on Easter Monday, 1958, he pulled out a sheet at random and saw the Roman numerals XV1, 16, and a date, 1793. A dictionary of dates, 1793, Louis XVI, French king, guillotined in Paris. On the same line of the journal, an X. Executed? Execution. In two minutes, he'd found the key. By midnight, the apparently simple code was cracked. It still took nine more years to translate the journal, which was 200,000 words long. I felt like an intruder, says Linda. It was strange how working through the papers, word by word, sheet by sheet, one forgot about the creator of Peter Rabbit and Jemima Puddle Duck, of Mrs. Tiggy Winkle and Pigling Bland, and began almost to feel the presence of another person, complex and unexpected, a second Beatrix Potter. spirit world of childhood, tempered and balanced by knowledge and common sense, to fear no longer the terror that flies by night, yet to feel truly and understand a little, a very little. The familiar Beatrix Potter, creator of at least 16 children's masterpieces, translated into 12 languages which sell several million copies a year. A flourishing industry has grown up around her creations. But behind them lies an enigmatic girl. Beatrix Potter remains possibly the most private, the least understood author of the century. Even now, her letters and sharply observed diary provide only a clue to a haunting personality. I am 17. Have heard it called sweet 17. No, indeed. Life is wearisome and disappointing. I'm terribly afraid of the future. How time moves and what it brings. So cold and stormy and yet such gleams of peace and light making the darkness stranger and more dreary. How will it end for me? I am descended from generations of Lancashire yeomen and weavers, obstinate hard-headed, matter-of-fact folk. The Potters were very rich. Grandfather Potter was a famous radical. His son, Rupert, was a barrister, but didn't practice. If my papa has a fault, he's rather voluble in conversation. And though not such a dragon, he is oppressively well-informed. Miss Joan Moore still remembers him. I was very much in awe of him because he had huge side whiskers all round his face and he looked just like a lion and fierce. But after I got to know him, he was so sweet and kind and friendly to children. All I remember of her mother was that she was just like Queen Victoria in her old age, only with a severe look on her face. And I know on one occasion when we visited them, she was in the carriage with us, and I was made to sit bolt upright and behave myself. And I did find her as easy to understand as dear old Mr. Potter. Dear old Mr. Potter was unburdened by a career, devoted to his clubs and hobbies, and meticulous in his own affairs. He kept a list of the houses he rented each summer. The one for 1866 was cancelled. Mrs. Potter was expecting. Helen Beatrix was born that July at the family's home in Bolton Gardens, Kensington. In those days, the nurseries of these middle-class homes were inhabited by children who lived subject to a tyrannous discipline. 
But things were different for Beatrix. She was left alone a lot, but though solitary, she was seldom lonely. She kept a rabbit, a hedgehog, bats, newts, lizards and snails, and a dormouse. A stream of artistic visitors called and climbed the stairs to her nursery. I wonder if ever another dormouse had so many acquaintances. Mr. Bright, Mr. Millet, Mr. Lee Smith have admired and stroked her. Her particular favourite, Mr. Gaskell, husband of the novelist. Papa Potter was a pioneer photographer in those days of brass-bound equipment and uncertain chemicals. Amongst his closest friends was the fashionable portrait painter Millet. I had brilliant colour as a little girl, which he used to provoke on purpose. He said I was a fine, handsome girl, but that my face was spoiled by the length of my nose. Rupert photographed Millet's child sitters if they fidgeted. He also took a photograph of Gladstone. Papa said he talked in set manner, as if he were making a speech. He told several long stories, the point of which was exceedingly difficult to find. Beatrix developed an intense passion for art. Her family engaged a drawing mistress. I have great reason to be grateful to her. Of course, I shall paint just as I like when I am not with her. I am convinced it lies chiefly with oneself. Even at the beginning, her drawing showed astonishing talent, especially for the intricate details of nature. These foxgloves were drawn when she was only nine. Why cannot one be content to look? I cannot rest. I must draw, however poor the result. At ten, she filled the pages of her sketchbook with animals, already skittishly clothing them in human dress while still catching their natural personalities. I don't want lessons. I want practice. I hope it is not pride that makes me so stiff against teaching, but it cannot be taught. A mill drawn when she was 11. Nature, except for air and water, is made of colour. Colour that most of us take so much for granted that we pass it by. Thank God I have the seeing eye. At 13, she made this marvellous drawing of one of her collection of pets, Benjamin Bouncer. At 16, she sketched the high Victorian interior of Ray Castle with its incredibly rich decor. Also at 16, a still life with oranges. At 17, peaches and grapes. And one day, she was drawing a pineapple. Mr. Halliday, the butler, was cutting it up on a plate behind me. I felt fit to kick under my chair, for I thought there would be none left. She made this exceptionally fine, scientifically exact drawing of a bat at 18. Example of the fierce excellence, the total absorption of this increasingly solitary girl, whose only real resources lay in herself. Thank goodness my education was neglected. I was never sent to school. It would have off some of the originality if I'd not died of shy being killed with overpressure. I fancy I could have been taught anything if I'd been caught young. Beatrix was often ill, but she had moments of considerable happiness. She was devoted to Papa and to her brother Bertram, and intensely curious about the natural world around her. Her father took his family each year to holiday in the Lake District. It sometimes happens that the town child is more alive to the fresh beauty of the country than a child who is country-born. My brother and I were born in London, but our descent, our interests and our joy were in the North Country. Childhood sorrows are sharp while they last, but they're like April showers serving to freshen the fields and make sunshine brighter than before. Here in the Lake District lay the excitements of abundant nature. These were her happiest childhood days. I have been laughed at for what I say I can remember. But it is admitted that I can remember quite plainly from one and two years old. Not only facts like learning to walk, but places and sentiments. The way things impressed a very young child. It is 
such a pleasure to watch the mare going, her tail whisking with satisfaction, neck curved, ears cocked, feet going like a circus horse to music. When she sees a hill, she takes the bit in her teeth, tucks in her chin. She swings along with slow, steady strides. She has so much spirit. She would never take a beating. I should almost as much expect one myself. I love to wander on the Troutbeck Fair. Usually I saw no one the whole day long, but sometimes I timed my rambles to cross the track of the shepherds when they drove a thousand sheep from the high fell for dipping. Sometimes I had with me an old sheepdog. More often I went alone, but never lonely. There was the company of the gentle sheep and wild flowers and singing waters. Troutbeck is uncanny, a place of silences and whispering echoes. I don't remember a time when I didn't try to invent pictures and make for myself a fairyland amongst the wild flowers, woods and streams, all the thousand objects of the countryside that pleasant, unchanging world of realism and romance, which in our northern clime is stiffened by hard weather, a tough ancestry, and the strength that comes from the hills. Now in the Lakeland woods, Beatrix found a new, consuming passion. Exciting her? Was overtaken with funguses, especially hygrophorus, found a lovely pink one, found upwards of 20 sorts in a few minutes. And stimulating her rich imagination. There's a table of rock with a dip, and all the little tiny fungus people singing and bobbing and dancing in the grass and under the leaves all down below, like the whistling that some people cannot hear of stray mice and bats. And I, sitting up above and knowing something about them. Beatrix poured all her talents and uncanny eye for detail into her drawings of fungi. She was almost grown up, but her future remained unsettled. There seemed no prospect of marriage. Could she become a botanist? She was both clever and determined enough. Her drawings, delicately beautiful, were also scientifically correct. Until the end of her days, Beatrix Potter considered these to be the best work she'd ever done and they are still the standard botanical illustrations of fungi. Today, work like this would surely lead to a career, which may well have been what Beatrix wanted then. Her uncle, himself a famous chemist, recognized her talent. He arranged that Beatrix should take her drawings of fungi to Kew to be evaluated by the director. We went across Kew Green to the herbarium, a fine old red brick house, I only hope I shall remember the fine gentleman with whom I had the honour of shaking hands. Mr Morris, who disclaimed all knowledge of fungi. I am exclusively tropical. Mr Baker, who bowed profoundly in silence. The director seemed pleased with my drawings and a little surprised, and did not address me again. Beatrix took her rebuff from the entrenched world of academics very much to heart, but she didn't give up. She haunted the libraries and prepared a learned paper on the propagation of spores. Having got it typed, I went by train to Kew, intending to deliver it in person to the director, Mr Thistleton Dyer, but I'm ashamed to say was overcome with shyness and bolted, incontinently fled. When I went to Kew again, I was not shy at all. I had it up and down with Mr Thistleton Dyer. But there was no place for an untrained woman in the scientific world. The setback was severe. It is odious to a shy person to be snubbed as conceited, especially when the shy person happens to be right and under the temptation of sauciness. I am up one day and down another. Have been a long way down today, and now my head feels empty and I'm nothing particular. 
Will things never settle? Is this being grown up? I'm 18 today. How time does go. I feel as if I had been going on such a time. What funny notions of life I used to have as a child. I have often thought of the time when I would be 18. It's a queer business. One day I was out collecting fossils, and unbidden to my mind sprang the thought that one day I might happen to become a fossil myself, which would save a great deal of trouble. When I have a bad time, the desire to draw is stronger than ever and settles on the queerest things. Last time, in the middle of September, I caught myself in the backyard making a careful and admiring copy of the swill bucket and the laugh it gave me brought me round. Three little mice sat down to spin. Pussy passed by and she peeped in. What are you at, my fine little men? Making coats for gentlemen. Shall I come in and cut off your threads? Oh no, Miss Pussy, you'd bite off our heads. Beatrix Potter must have given up all hope of the academic world. Was she now seeking unconsciously an area which, though less attractive than botany, could be made all her own? Her governess had married and become Mrs. Moore. In time, there were several children, and Beatrix used to visit the family. She used to come over and see us. I believe she came over every time a fresh baby was born, and there were eight of us. We liked her coming. She said, because of funny little ways. And we used to laugh because she had a little hat with a small brim. Instead of elastic under the chin, she had narrow velvet ribbon tied underneath, which really gave her a very pleasing look. She had such a, a nice, kind face and soft voice. We children you were awfully attracted to her. She used to come in with her little cages in her hand because she always brought something, either little white mice or little guinea pigs. Something like that she used to bring over. And of course, we children were thrilled. And uh, she used to come into the drawing room and she let these little things loose. And of course, they flew all over the drawing room. We children, were, we loved that. And then while we were playing with these animals, uh, Mother and Beatrix Potter used to have talks together. And uh, she had such a lovely little fascinating laugh, you know, when we children were running after these mice with a little sort of twist to her mouth. We used to find her lo ourselves looking at her because she, she was fascinating to children. She used to write us letters and we got so excited that the postman, nearly always at breakfast time, I remember the letters coming. Of course, some Noel used to get the most. He was the first of the family. And we used to be thrilled opening these letters. And they were quite long, you know, long note paper, that you, four pages sort of glazed in those days, which were opened. And she used to begin, my dear Noel, or my dear Eric, whoever the letter was to. And she used to go off with killing stories about things that happened in the garden, or the, the uh, gardeners. And all down the side of the page were these little drawings of a little man running after she wasn't so good at men and uh, people, although we used to think them very nice. My dear Noel, I don't know what to write to you, so I shall tell you a story about four little rabbits whose names were Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail and Peter. They lived with their mother in a sandbank under the root of a big fir tree. Now, my dears, said old Mrs Bunny, you may go into the field or down the lane, but don't go into Mr McGregor's garden. Flopsy, Mopsy and Cottontail, who were good little rabbits, went down the lane to gather blackberries. But Peter, who was very naughty, ran straight away to Mr. McGregor's garden and squeezed underneath the gate. First he ate some lettuce and some broad beans, then some radishes, and then, feeling rather sick, he went to look for some parsley. Peter was ill during the evening in consequence of overeating himself. His mother put him to bed and gave him a dose of chamomile tea. But Flopsy, Mopsy and Cottontail had bread and milk and blackberries for supper. I'm coming back to London next Thursday, so I do hope I shall see you soon, and the new baby. I remain, dear Noel, yours affectionately, 
Beatrix Potter. And Mother used to say, we, we must take great care of these letters because they were so beautifully illustrated. And um, we used to put them in our little desks. And then one day, Miss Potter used to, began to find out how we loved these letters. Mother used to read them to us. And um, she said, could she borrow them and have them back? She had ideas, I suppose. So Mother collected all our letters and sent them back. And I think that's really how she got into the idea that children were taking on. She thought she might perhaps be able to write some books. Beatrix Potter, deeply hurt by her setbacks and rejections, turned now to a field where there were no crusty academics to thwart her, where it was no disadvantage to be female and lacking formal education. Her notebooks were full of animals masquerading as human beings. Beatrix saw that here was the stuff of a children's book. She prepared the text and made more drawings using her own pet rabbits, Benjamin Bouncer and later Peter, as models. He has an appetite for certain sorts of paints, eats sweeties, peppermints. He adores buttered toast and always presents himself in the drawing room when he hears a tea bell. Peter Rabbit has an old quilt made of scraps of flannel and blue cloth on which he always lies. Since nobody would publish her books, she did so herself. The first, The Tale of Peter Rabbit, was printed privately and cost her 14 pounds. My books are made small to fit children's hands, not to impress grown-ups. Only then did the children's book publishers, Warns, agree to bring it out themselves. It was the start of a long relationship. Beatrix redrew Peter Rabbit in colour, overjoyed. My first act was to give Benjamin Bouncer, what an investment that rabbit has been in spite of the hutches, a cup full of hemp seeds. The consequence being that when I wanted to draw him next morning, he was partially intoxicated and wholly unmanageable. Then I retired to bed and lay awake chuckling till two in the morning and afterwards had an impression that Bunny came to my bedside in a white cotton nightcap and tickled me with his whiskers. Next came the tailor of Gloucester. If she could not draw fungi, then she would create the best children's books. These drawings she made scrupulously from embroideries in the Victoria and Albert Museum. This time the text was longer and more polished, and as always she drew the animals exactly. Beatrix took infinite pains over the preparation of her books. Winifred Warren. She came one day, it must have been, I think she came to lunch at uh, Surbiton, and uh, she came really to look at our doll's house because she was going to make a book of it and to paint it. And uh, she came up to the nursery and I remember seeing her come in in a dark coat and skirt and with a rather a plain looking lady with a, a bun and a, a man's umbrella. <laughs> I don't know whether she had it with her but I remember about the umbrella because um, it had to be taken back to Bedford Square the next day. She left it behind in our house. But um, <clears throat> she, she just said, how do you do to us? And I think kissed us, you know, and she wanted to borrow a, a policeman doll that she was going to put into the book. And I remember our nanny produced the doll and I thought, oh dear, I shall not see that again, you see, and was rather upset that it was going to be taken away. She was uh, rather a stiff, severe grown up and uh, rather shy. I think she was very shy. And uh, she didn't seem to be able to uh, talk to us very easily. I think she seemed a little, little shy of us. But I think she wanted to be friendly with us. She wanted to, to be nice to us. And she was, uh, I remember that she was nice to my nanny, whom I loved very much. And that impressed me favorably, and I liked her for that. She was a person that you'd be rather, rather frightened of as a child, I think. I, we wouldn't have dared to be rude to her or anything, or 
cheeky to her. She was, uh, she, she had a sort of dignity, I suppose you might say, really. Norman Warren looked after Beatrix Potter's affairs. It was not easy. She was the most serious of authors. They worked together on Apley Dapley's nursery rhymes. Apley Dapley, a little brown mouse, goes to the cupboard in somebody's house. In somebody's cupboard there's everything nice. Cake, cheese, jam, biscuits, all charming for mice. Apley Dapley has little sharp eyes, and Apley Dapley is so fond of pies. A deep understanding grew up between them. In the summer of 1905, they became engaged. Well, he used to come down to Surbiton quite a lot, almost every Saturday, to play tennis with my father and mother. And uh, he always had tea with us and played with us. And of course, in the winter, when they were indoors, he used to play games with us. And I remember him carrying us about, and I remember him uh, on the floor, you know, and we were riding on his back. <laughs> One Saturday, he didn't arrive. And uh, I remember my nurse saying, Oh, Uncle Norman hasn't been able to come this afternoon. He's not well. He's had all his teeth out. And then he didn't come again. We used to look forward to the Saturdays to seeing him, but he didn't come again. And we've heard that he was very ill. And uh, I remember my father being very upset and worried. And then I remember some time afterwards being told that he died. And um, Beatrice Potter, I think, must have been staying in London with them, or somewhere near, or perhaps she was at her own home, but she was in London. And uh, the f when the funeral took place, she didn't go to the funeral. She stayed in his bedroom in Bedford Square and did a drawing of it. And I remember my father being very, very cut up because they were very close. And he, he said that uh, Uncle Norman looked exactly like Robert Louis Stevenson in his coffin. Norman was buried in Highgate Cemetery. How much Beatrix Potter suffered from his death, we cannot tell. Her letters reveal little, but her output of books continued unabated. Indeed, now she was approaching the prime of her creative powers. The scent of the heather the wind through the fir trees. Even when the thunder growled in the distance and the wind swept up the valley, oh, it was always beautiful home. I remember the sun sinking behind the mountains, purple shadows down the ravines, white mist rising from the river. Then an hour or two later, the harvest moon, night jars hooting of owls, a bat that flitted round the house and the roe deer's bark sounded from the dark woods. She returned to the Lake District. With the royalties from Peter Rabbit, she'd bought Hilltop. From here, she visited her parents and Bolton Gardens less and less. She was freer now. I increasingly derived satisfactions from a less than elevated source, that of having money. It's something to have a little money to spend on books and look forward to being independent though forlorn. More and more her drawings and stories reflected the houses, the very stones and lanes of the village she'd made her home. The pie and the patty pan. Duchess's garden from the same book. The tale of Tom Kitten. And Pigling Bland. Beatrix Potter's maid. You could tell when she was on with the book, she never spoke to you. She would just go about it now. I used to think, oh dear me, what have I done now? I thought I, it was me that was in the fault, you see. But she was thinking about what she was doing, what she was writing. And she would just go about like in a dream. 
Beatrix's close affinity with the Lake District and its wildlife shines through her writings. She really knew her subjects. She'd kept, reared, sketched, even dissected the animals whose characters she so acutely depicted. Brock is the country name for Badger. Tommy Brock was a short, bristly, fat, waddling person with a grin. He ate wasps' nests and frogs and worms. He was not nice in his habits. As he slept in the daytime, he went to bed in his boots. Mr. Todd is a common name for fox. Nobody could call Mr. Todd nice. The sheep could smell him half a mile off. He was of wandering habit and had foxy whiskers. He had a long, bushy tail, prick ears. No one knew where he'd be next. He had half a dozen houses, but he was seldom at home. He was vindictive. There will never be any love loss between dogs and Mr. Todd. Beatrix Potter's books are remarkably true to nature. Her animal heroes are attractive, like Jemima Puddle Duck and Peter Rabbit, or unattractive and crotchety, like Mr. Todd and Mr. Brock, according to their animal counterparts. She never tries to gloss over the unpleasant side of things. For instance, Peter Rabbit's father ends up in Mr. McGregor's pie. She drew and wrote of humans with far less insight. Animals she felt for and understood. A very pretty house mouse with a long tail and fine whiskers. Ate hayseeds and wild fruits. Dare not run by day for fear of buzzard hawks or go far by moonlight for fear of the horned owl. There are always cats at the farmhouse. Even when nobody is there, cats locked out when everyone has gone to market. They had dear little fur coats of their own and they tumbled about and played in the dust. To what Beatrix Potter herself called a seeing eye, even ordinary farmyard events seemed full of dramatic life. Mrs. Rebecca Puddle Duck was perfectly willing to leave the hatching to someone else. I have not the patience to sit on a nest for 28 days, and no more have you, Jemima. You would let them go cold. You know you would. I wish to hatch my own eggs. I will hatch them all by myself, quacked Jemima Puddle Duck. Too many storybooks for children are condescending, self-conscious inventions. And through some trivial oversight, some small, incorrect detail, gives the whole show. A quiet Lakeland solicitor, William Helis, had arranged the purchase of help for Beatrix and helped her in the building up of her sorry properties. Naturally, he often called on her at Hilltop. One Friday, they went to London together. Nobody knew in Surrey they were going to get married. Oh, no, it was a perfect secret. When she came back again some day dressed her as Miss Potter, she says, Miss Potter, indeed. She says, I'm not Miss Potter. She says, I'm Mrs. Willie Ellis. He used to go by the name of Appleby Willie, because he was from Appleby, you see. And there was another Willie Ellis, so he was Appleby. No, no, she says, I'm going to... Get married to uh, Mr. Healy. She got married that morning. And uh, he used to come to see her, but people thought he was just coming on business because he did all her business, you say. But ne no idea that they were courting or anything of that sort. Well, nobody knew, not even canons that uh, were living at Hilltop. I am very happy and in every way satisfied with Willie. It is best not to look back now. Of course, they went in different ways. He would, uh, he was uh, go off with his, to his mauling, uh, to his dancing, uh, carling, going to, to neighbours carling, while she would be sitting in the dining room painting and writing and doing that sort of thing. 
But she, she was always wanting to be doing something. She would have a club on, grey woolen stockings, a grey tweed skirt, a grey knitted jumper, a little brown bonnet, and that's how she went about. She was always wearing things that came off the shape. You see, all the wool and that sort of thing. It had to be wool. From the day she married Helith, she stopped writing. Only one bad book followed. It was as though she'd simply shrugged off her astonishing gifts. Now she devoted her whole time to her sheep farm. The acclaimed Beatrix Potter was dead, and as Mrs. Helis, she withdrew into her private world. Once her friends had been publishers and painters, radicals and writers. Now, though exceedingly rich and crotchety, she was content to mix with simple sheep farmers. I'm in the chair at Herdwick Breeders. He would have laughed to see me among the other old farmers, usually in a tavern after a sheep fair. Our Herdwick sheep with their hard, waterproof jackets are the only sort that can flourish in the high fells. Herdwick lambs are born with black faces. They turn white at a year old. They cut the lamb's tails because they catch in briars and get sore. It was 1940. Let us hope for peace before another new year. But we will just stick it out, whatever happens. People take it calmly, with temper, not fear. The sheep and cattle take no notice. Tom Storey managed her sheep farm. The people who worked with her, close to the land of the Lake District, knew her best. Oh, any old Macintosh would do her. A baby's cake sack. Often see her in a, with a baby's cake sack round her, her shoulders. When she was going to the village, to the shop, the wet day she would have a cake sack on her shoulders. That's when she met the tramp at the top of the hill there. When she's going to the shop with her basket, and the, the old roadster met her there, and he said, it's a bad day for the likes of you and me, missus. <laughs> Thinking that she was a tramp also. <laughs> she never made him any wiser. She used to go across pretty regular. Come across the field here, through the gate, and she had a wooden style made over the, into the orchard, across the orchard, through the gate the other end, and up onto the heights. And the highest point in the heights, there was a, a big flat stone she used to sit on. You could see her when you were working on the, in the fields, sitting writing on that, and she was sitting on that stone. All by myself, I watch a weird dance. In the midst of a waste of yellow, bent grass, there is a patch of green with a stunted thorn. Round the tree, round and round, in a measured canter, went four of the wild fell ponies. Round and round, then checked and turned, round and round, reversed. Who had taught them? I have thought the whole countryside belonged to the fairies, and that they come out of the woods by moonlight into the fields and onto the dewy grass beside the streams. There are not many hedgehogs, which are fairy beasts, but there are the green sour ringlets whereon the ewe knot bites. And how without the aid of the fairy folk could there be so little mildew in the corn? She couldn't bear to see a lot of people about the village, my opinion. She liked everything quiet. In fact, I don't think she liked children, myself. Well, I don't think she did. My own children. I just a boy and a girl. The girl was seven when I came here, and the boy was four. And uh, as time went on, she thought the world of the boy, but she hadn't room for the girl. For instance, playing in the hay field. In the field just over the hedge there. And there were, of course, still another two or three children with her, running around amongst the uh, 
Haycox, it was Haycox those days. And he came into the field and turned them out, tell them to go out. And the other one doing a bit of harm. Just just two way. There was mist and a gleam of blue sky through the hazy clouds. No wind, but a faint autumn breath of dead leaves. Autumn is the pleasantest season of the year. None the less pleasant for being the end, as the last breath of sweets is the sweetest last. I'm written out for storybooks, and my eyes are too tired for painting. She died, uh, was it, two or three days before Christmas. I was up talking to her two days before she died, in the room. And, of course, you know, she was cremated. And, uh, Mr. Hillis brought the ashes for me to scatter. She once told me where they had to be scattered, and uh, nobody had to know about it. So he brought them across and gave them to me, and I scattered her ashes where she wanted them scattering, and that was that. That was on Christmas Day. And nobody knows to this day. <coughs> Only myself. It's a fine day. What heaven can be more real than to retain the spirit world of childhood, tempered and balanced by knowledge and common sense, to fear no longer the terror that flieth by night, yet to feel truly and understand a little, a very little.